Good morning. It's day 31 of the Vendée Globe and joining me this morning is David Sims. David is a senior research fellow at the Marine Biological Association here in Plymouth. He's also a professor of marine ecology at the National Oceanogra Oceanography Centre in Southampton. I was first introduced to David many years ago as the, the shark man. He is regarded as uh, the leading authority on pelagic sharks, their movement and conservation with regard to anthropogenic impacts. So welcome, David. Hello, morning. How are you doing? It look, doesn't Very look good, quite yeah. so sunny in your office this morning. I know you've got wonderful views across the sound. I do. I'm looking across Plymouth Sound now towards Drake's Island and the Breakwater. It's beautiful, but, but cloudy. <laughs> no sharks out there today. Oh, they're there. They're definitely there. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> So just to kick off, I mean, it would be useful just to, um, you know, give us a, a little bit of your background in terms of, you know, the work you're doing with both pelagic and, and, and nearshore neuritic sharks. Um, and, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the, the Vendée Globe and perhaps, you know, how some of these boats may encounter some of these big species along the, along the way. Fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, we've been satellite tracking uh, pelagic sharks for the last sort of 20 odd years and when I say satellite tracky we, we fit transmitters uh, onto their fins uh, which are then followed by satellites uh, and we can get all sorts of data as well dive data and temperature uh, and over the years obviously it's not just us there's lots of people uh, lots of research groups around the world that are also tracking and so one thing we've done recently is to bring all those research groups together about 40 different research groups around the world to collate all these satellite tracks of pelagic sharks, things like blue sharks, short fin mako sharks, great white sharks, and of course, whale sharks as well. And by bringing all the tracks together, uh, we get fascinating insights into where they hang out. What are their sort of space use hotspots? Where are we most likely to find them? What, what are the habitats that they really like? We can also then look at how they move between these different habitats. Uh, what are their migration corridors, for example? Yep. And from you mentioned about anthropogenic threats, of course, we're relating those uh, uh, movements and space use patterns to things like fishing fishing effort uh, from satellite tracks of fishing vessels themselves, and also shipping movements as well. So we're building up a, a global view of where these large sharks like to be and what they'll encounter when they're there, not just biologically, but also uh, uh, crossing over with human activities as well. Okay, okay. So there's a, in, in, the, in the racing world, there's a growing awareness um, and concern about the number of collisions offshore sailing teams are experiencing. In, in, in the Vendée Globe itself, uh, in 2016-17, there were um, six collisions um, with, you know, what what's loosely termed uh, unidentified floating objects but but in the main you know a lot of these collisions are with you know with with big fish with sunfish um you know with with whales and uh you know we've seen some even quite dramatic footage of, of boats uh, encountering whales uh over half of the teams are fit have fitted uh a sort of a watch keeping assistance to help them it's a system called the oscar which is an infrared and thermal camera, has a range of about 300 meters. Uh, and we'll obviously see things you know, on the surface. So if a, if, a, if a shark or a whale is below the surface, it's, it's not really that much use. Um, some other teams also have pingers as a deterrent uh, to disturb the animals. But of course, you know, I'm interested to find out um, you know, if you do disturb an animal, what's its natural reaction? Does it just come to the surface, which of course you know, is probably the worst thing that could happen in the circumstances of a ship bearing down on it. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of wondering, first of all, is there enough data in these sort of migratory tracks and corridors for us to be able to, um, you know, help race organizers with plotting their, their, their races, particularly spatially um, and also, you know, over time, because I guess some of these animals are moving at certain seasons. That's right. Yes, I mean we we are in a position now after satellite tracking not just not just sharks, but there are other research groups that we're working with, 
that are tracking whales, uh, large seals, uh, and, and seabirds as well, actually. Um, and by bringing all that data together, we're in a position to build up a global view of the sort of migratory highways and space use patterns. And that's exactly what's happening. I mean, we last year, we published uh, the global maps of sharks. There was another group uh, that published uh, maps of the movements of whales and seals and birds around Antarctica, actually, um, where some of the, the yachts might be at least, uh, you know, moving, uh, you know, along that sort of polar front. Um, so we are building up this global picture. And in fact, over the next year, uh, there's an even larger project that will be bringing together all of the sort of marine megafauna, ocean mm -hmm. sunfish, tuna, uh, uh, e even even polar bear movement data will be brought together. And these maps will, will be published and they'll be available. And there's no reason why uh, race organizers can't consult these when they're published uh, and then talk to some of the marine biologists to figure out what the risks might be to some of the yachts at certain times, because obviously animals aren't migrating all the time, um, but they might be hanging out in a particular area of ecological importance for, for a long period of time yep. before then moving somewhere else. And it's that sort of timing and synchronicity that we can get from these sorts of, of maps and understanding. So I would say that the the, this scientific data is going to, to come online within the next year or so, collating thousands and thousands of tracks. Uh, and that will give a, really the first picture uh, of how animals are moving around in the ocean at, at the big scale. And I think that will be really useful, not just for race organizers, but also for how we assess the overlap of these uh, amazing marine animals with other sorts of human activities, such yeah. as shipping, for example. And, and, and obviously, you know, leisure craft as well. So yeah. that's uh, fun, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. It, when it comes to deterrent, um, you know, it's a particular sort of question. If you were to, you know, admit a pinger or something, you know, to, to, to scare off anything in front, um, it, you know, is, are they effective? Is that something that, uh, you know, you know that they'll dive down and get out the way? Um, you know, what's, 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 are, are yeah. they, are they useful to the sort of marine leisure market? Yeah, I, I can imagine they would be, but of course, yeah. Things are always more complicated than that, aren't they? Um, it rather depends uh, what the pinger frequency and the intensity of the sound is, because different marine animals uh, can hear different ranges of yeah. sound frequency. And of course, something like sharks, for example, they generally uh, hear lower frequency. So, you know, usually below about one kilohertz, uh, right down to sort of maybe, you know, 10 to 40 hertz that's really quite low if you look at the other end which is sort of dolphins yep. they're really uh you know can take high frequency it's up to 200 kilohertz they, yep. they can hear yep. so it depends what your where, where your what your ping of frequency is but generally speaking uh, scientific trials have been done attaching pingers to nets for example to try yep. and reduce bycatch of species and certainly they do seem to reduce the number of, uh, of catches and interactions with the nets uh, for porpoises and dolphins and also turtles as well actually I've seen some data on turtles so it rather does depend what your what your pinger frequency is and also the sound intensity as to whether the animal will hear it in time but if they do hear it in time it could be that they uh, usually animals respond to new sounds by curiosity they're, they're, they're cautious uh, and it might be that they move away but usually if there's a if there is an avoidance response they will tend to dive deeper rather than come to the surface yeah, well that's uh, that's a good good thing now you shared uh, uh, one of the, um, the sort of maps of, uh, of pelagic and, and neuritic um, sharks um, and I was you know really quite interested by this because uh, first of all you know these are great whites or at least in in the model the, the picture they were great whites um, and I'd always assumed, you know, that this was a sort of fairly warm water mm. species, um, plenty of them around, you know, the, the coast of South Africa, Indian Ocean. But looking at your, your map here, which I'll just bring up, uh, it, uh, it seems that actually they venture quite a long way south, even as far as um, possibly the, the Kerguelen Islands, 
Um, and I know that these are relatively small numbers, but it does seem that there are more fish perhaps in the pathway of some of these around the world races than we think. I, th I think that's right. Uh, I mean, Great Whites, for example, as you can see there, we're looking at sort of the map at the top and the one at the sort of bottom right. Um, and those are Great White shark tracks. And you can see there that from South Africa, uh, those individual sharks are ranging right out uh, into the southern Pacific Ocean and, you know, even coming close to to the polar front in, in, in some areas. Um, and they're moving out into those oceanic areas uh, to forage on marine mammals, but also large fishes as well, uh, before moving back towards the coastline. So a lot of these pelagic sharks, uh, and it's true of whale sharks as well, which of course are involved in collisions with shipping. Uh, we think that actually the numbers of collisions with whale sharks and shipping is much higher than 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 you know thought currently, uh, and that's because not only are they spending time in a particular area that may overlap with shipping and yachting and, and leisure craft, but also uh, they're moving out into oceanic areas where they may cross the paths of much larger vessels as well. Uh, and don't forget that these sharks are spending a lot of their time at the surface, although they're capable of diving. I mean. You know, uh, we've we've tracked uh, whale sharks diving to over 1.2 kilometers down, and we know that they go to probably a couple of kilometers down. So they're they're capable of going very deep, but they spend most of their time, 50, 60 percent of their time, in the top 10 to 20 meters of water. So there there is a, a potential risk in areas where you have lots of these large sharks and, and other animals such as marine mammals spending time at the surface and these yachts and those great whites. I mean, certainly they're in the vicinity uh, of of the Vendée yachts. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, venturing out the sharks venturing out from the coast into the oceanic and then back again are, cr are, cr are potentially crossing paths with the with the Vendée race itself. The speeds of these vessels um, is quite, you know, extraordinary now. And I'm, you know, I'm guessing that that for a lot of the bigger species like the whales, they're quite slow moving. You know, if if suddenly a, a vessel's travelling at thirty knots, is it going to have much chance to to really respond and get out the way? Uh, that it's unlikely it will. If if a, if a yacht is travelling at sort of twenty to thirty knots, uh, that for whale sharks, for instance, that's that's you know many many times the speed at which they'll uh, be able to you know swim to get out of the way it could be that they can't respond in time even if they they hear the vessel coming the speed of the vessel will close that distance faster than the animal's uh, t uh, sort of movement time so in, in other analyses we've been doing in our team here uh, we found that looking at close interactions between whale sharks and and shipping uh, whale sharks are tending to travel uh, and move around about 10 times slower than those vessels. And they're, and they're not even going as fast as the, the Vendée yachts. So, yes, it, it's tricky. If there is a, a, an ocean sunfish, a, a whale shark, or a basking shark, or, or whales in front of the yachts, um, they'll struggle to get out of the way in time, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, look, that's been really, really interesting. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, look at the the, uh, the the race scenario and the weather and strategy now. But uh, you know, it'd be great perhaps uh, further down down downstream we we catch up again. Um, you know, fingers crossed there aren't any more collisions during the race. But uh, you know, certainly this is a topic I know that it's very close to some of the uh, race organisers. And um, you know, as more and more of your data comes online it'll be really interesting to sort of potentially bridge that gap uh, and, uh, and, and get some of these organisers to see the, the, the work you're doing. So thank you very much for joining me this morning. And, yeah, uh, no problem, thanks. Catch up again soon. Yeah. This was a situation a few days ago now with just the, uh, the weather front uh, behind both Charlie and, uh, and Thomas. Um, and as we see, as we play it forward over the next uh, few, sort of 24 hours, you can see that the uh, the front actually catches up with and passes o over the top of Charlie um, and the situation right now is he's uh, he's probably through the worst of it um, into the sort of more west southwest airstream um, the strongest of the of the breeze passes through and probably in a safer environment um, the other interesting one is uh, is Armel Tripon who 
and so he managed to avoid the, the worst of that low pressure. The, the two boats behind him tacked off to the north um, and then they're now pretty much in the centre of that depression but on the favourable side, you know, still in sort of southerly winds it looks like there and uh, they should pass um, through that as it as it passes to the south of them. If we look at the forecast, uh, we can see that that's the current situation. Uh, so Charlie's, you, you know, just behind that that front, uh, and uh, should be in, in in much safer environment now. Armel Tripon made a huge gain, uh, m managing to stay sort of out of the way of that depression. Uh, of course, the boats behind uh, tacked tacked further north. So we've got these three distinct groups now. We've got the sort of you know the main pack of ten to twelve boats up in front, uh, the sort of mid pack led by Armel Tripon, and then we've got the, the 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 rear back all really nicely bunched together in in good favourable conditions. And if we just look at the forecast over the next few days, uh, really the, the the Indian Ocean is looking kind of much kinder uh, for the rest of the fleet. So into Friday. Um, you can see sort of dominated by this big high pressure. Um, you know, not too many active uh, lows in in the area. So um, let's hope for the next few days at least all of the teams have a sort of period of uh, relatively stable conditions to look forward to. Uh, and uh, the next cape is Cape Lewin. So uh, not far, far away, probably over the weekend, we'll see the first few boats passing that. So that's it for today. Really fascinating to catch up with Professor David Sims uh, and find out a lot more about um, you know these migratory routes and tracks of these big marine pelagic fish. Uh, on Friday, I'm uh, chatting to Dan Redding, who's the sustainability manager for World Sailing, and uh, and so we're going to ask him a few more questions about uh, some of the things that the teams are doing and World Sailing are doing in this area. Uh, look forward to that. See you again soon. Bye-bye.